Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Eric Chang, and he is a neuroscientist and assistant professor at the Institute of Bioelectronic Medicine and Molecular Medicine at the Feinstein Institute uh, in Northwell Health in New York. Uh, he studies uh, neuroimmunology, electrophysiology, microscope, and bioengineering, and basically tries to tease apart which signals are causing which effects in the vagus nerve. Uh, the Northwell Health and Feinstein Institute is very much interested in the vagus nerve and basically the bioelectronic medicine effects that it can have reducing inflammation with uh, neural signals. So exciting stuff. And another one of our collection of Feinstein Institute researchers there's been a lot. There's been like a half dozen so far on this show. So hopefully you enjoy it. Eric Chang, pleasure to have you on the show. You are a neuroscientist and assistant professor over at the Feinstein Institute uh, in Bioelectronic Medicine. We are fans of the uh, Feinstein Institute over here at the Neural Implant Podcast. We've had... Geez, I don't know, like six people on from the show from their Northwest Health over in New York. Um, you North, Northwell. focus especially on your, sorry, Northwell, uh, Northwell <laughs> uh, Health. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, shoot, I have it in my notes as Northwest. That's weird. I, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> I should know. <laughs> That's okay. But uh, you, you talk especially about neuroimmunology, electrophysiology, microscopy, and bioengineering. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do, uh, what your research is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, my name is Eric Chang. I'm um, assistant professor at the Feinstein Institutes at Northwell Health. Um, and I also have an appointment with the uh, Zucker School of Medicine, which is affiliated with uh, Hofstra University. And uh, in our lab... Um, like you said, my background's in uh, neuroscience and neurophysiology. Um, in our lab, we're, we're interested in looking at the connection between the nervous system and the immune system and uh, basically applying uh, tools uh, that are familiar to neuroscientists, um, such as optogenetics, um, calcium imaging of uh, neuronal activity, um, and uh, you know, standard electrophysiology to try to understand uh, what are the signals used by the um, nervous system, in particular the peripheral nervous system, uh, to communicate signals about the immune system? So, uh, you know, when there's inflammation in a part of the body, uh, we know um, from an immunology standpoint, cytokines are released um, by the innate immune system. And then, you know, how, how does the brain then uh, know uh, through communications in nerves such as the vagus nerve, which I know you know a little bit about, um, how, how does the brain get the information about, you know, where is the inflammation taking place? How much inflammation is there? Those are all at some level encoded by the nervous system. And, you know, we think through, uh, you know, traditional you know, nerve spiking, uh, changes in membrane depolarization. Um, but, you know, kind of the principles and the rules about uh, how do cytokines relate to nerve activity is still uh, kind of an open question. That's something we're looking at. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, I, I like this idea of basically bringing together chemical and electrical uh, side of things. And, and that that seems to be like what exactly you're doing and, uh, you know, kind of trying to find that correlation between the two. So so how is uh, imaging different than electrophysiology and what are kind of the advantages and disadvantages of both? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. So this is a, I mean, this is um, part of the reason why it's exciting. I, like, I think it's exciting to work in this field because Within the space of neurophysiology, there's um, a more recent um, development of optical physiology, which is essentially uh, using different um, fluorescent tags, optical indicators. You know, people are probably familiar with calcium uh, imaging um, to image changes in fluxes in calcium. Uh, there's also newer lines of voltage indicators. So, you know, you can image now dopamine uh, being released and um, basically... Uh, see where it is, you know, like uh, being released within a population of neurons and then also image the activity. So instead of, you know, traditionally you, uh, you know, my background was training as a patch clamp, you know, electrophysiologist. So you, you know, put a glass pipette onto a single neuron, which is, you know, painstaking because you and you only get to listen to one neuron. 
you know, you get very high, you know, good temporal resolution and you know what's happening with that one cell. But, you know, um, if you wanted to know what its neighbors were doing, you could, again, try to patch five at a time. Some labs do that. Uh, again, that's uh, pretty painstaking and labor intensive. Now you can uh, basically create transgenic lines or do viral methods to put indicators in hundreds of neurons or let's say glutamatergic neurons or all cholinergic neurons have some voltage indicator. Then you can image it with a, you know, a fairly simple, like a CMOS sensor even. You don't need very fancy um, imaging devices and see the activity um, at the level of either calcium or maybe a voltage readout in, in the more recent work um, of hundreds of neurons at a time. So, um, you know, we're, uh, applying some of those tools in the periphery, uh, to image ganglia. Um, you know, there's a, one of the ganglia connected to the vagus nerve is called the nodose ganglion. And the next synapse into the brain is, uh, into the brain stem. Um, but we think that's one of the areas where these signals coming up from the body send information about inflammation going to the brain. So, so this optical optical uh, physiology is kind of a, a newer technique uh, that's, I wouldn't say replacing standard electrophysiology, but it's starting to compete with it. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, in the neuroscience space, there's, there's a lot of debate about, you know, does GCAMP6 or GCAMP7 or 8, these calcium indicators, um, what's the fidelity as far as a transient, a calcium transient to a single action potential? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of papers that are just examining that, you know, uh, and at this moment, it's not a direct one to one, but the indicators are getting better and better. Um, so it's, uh, I would say patch clamp physiology, you know, patching a single cell with a glass pipette is still the gold standard, but the tools are rapidly, uh, coming to fore, um, that are starting to, uh, replace that a little bit. And, and the sampling you get just from the number of neurons, you know, now there's a lot of bigger is better, um, you know, so, you know, if you want to record from thousands of neurons, uh, you can do that optically. Um, and then those start to compete with, you know, let's say Utah arrays and other more traditional electrodes uh, that are, of course, you know, da damaging because um, they're penetrating in some cases. Um, so it's always a, a trade off with you know, what's the best technology to answer your specific question? Uh, how, how invasive or non-invasive is it? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's an exciting time to start applying some of these tools, I think, to the questions in the field of neuroimmunology. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, I, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I mean, before, if you wanted to look at some of these proteins and, you know, protein markers, uh, expression, everything like this, you'd have to, you know, sacrifice the animal and then stain it, you know, and that's a very labor intensive process as well, but you only have one time point. And sure. because biology is so noisy, I, I basically consider it like 30% noise, um, compared to like an engineering or something like this, where you get like 3% noise. Um, but, uh, you know, with the machine or something like this, uh, the biological machine is, is very, you know, it's, it's all over the place. Um, so it's, it's really cool. It's kind of the future to be able to, to monitor this kind of stuff like real time and, and see how things are reacting to certain stimuli or something like this. Um, so in this way, in vivo imaging is possible with these different uh, and monitoring different cell types, right? And, and then how many? Um, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, uh, it has the so same the resolution, right? Well, I mean, the so I mean, there's obviously uh, acute experiments that are done under anesthesia, um, and then there's uh, for kind of like brain directed because you can fix, you know, let's say a miniscope or a cal confocal microscope onto a, the skull of an animal and even have them freely moving, let's say on a ball um, or in an environment if it's tethered and, or, and now people are developing wireless devices, uh, you can then image, you know, longitudinally, let's say chronically, right? Uh, and monitor changes that are happening, let's say with microglia or in some, or, you know, cell firing some population you're interested in looking at. Um, these, these, uh, are a little more challenging to apply these chronic tools uh, in the periphery, which is a lot of where we're doing our work, um, you know, because, you know, let's say you want to interface with the vagus nerve. It's in the neck, in, in our necks, as well as in the neck of a mouse. 
uh, and that's you know a very dynamic environment. So as opposed to fixing something to the skull, and then the, even the head's moving around, but your thing's on the skull, so you know the tissue you're imaging is not really moving um, at all, if if at all, right? Um, if you want to look at things happening in you know, let's say uh, area like the neck. Uh, you were presented with a lot more challenges. So some of the the people here at Feinstein, uh, I think you spoke to Stavrozanos before, uh, his lab uh, is developing uh, chronic interfaces for the vagus nerve in in small animals like the mouse. Um, but there, there, there are a lot of challenges with that. And I think uh, obviously you want to, you know, the optimum case is to design a chronic long-term interfacing, uh, whether it's a camera or a, a nerve interface, um, something that's stable, you know, and so you can look at your biological signal over time, you know, uh, and the reason why that's important, particularly for things we study is if you want to model a disease in a preclinical model, uh, you know, typically, you know, there, you can either induce a disease acutely, like with an injection, let's say of, of a, you know, an antibody, uh, to induce something like, let's say arthritis, uh, or, you know, if it's a genetic model, there might be a progression of the disease over time. So, uh, you want to follow that over time in a living animal. And then, you know, if you're going to intervene in some way, either with a drug or with a bioelectronic intervention, you want to be able to measure again over time that that thing's changing. Like you said, if you have to sack the animal every time to see, you know, let's do some histology here. And then in a different group of animal, we treated them and we did histology here. Of course, you do group group uh, based comparisons, but ideally, uh, I think you you know it's stronger to get a within sample within animal uh, measurement, right? So uh, that way you can still do groups, but then you're seeing within an animal. You know, we induce disease at this point. We saw this change, let's say, in in microglia or in cell firing. Uh, then we did our let's say you know, vagus nerve stimulation, for example, and we saw this change. So uh, in the same animal, you can see those kind of biological changes happening. And I think that's kind of the more most powerful design you can hope for. Um, in many cases, you can't do that uh, because some tools, you know, you have to do under anesthesia. Some manipulations are, you know, um, you know, you can't do chronically. So, um, but I think we're making a steady progress towards that um, possibility. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff, but uh, it, I didn't even realize how, how much harder it was, you know, to, to have it in the, the periphery compared to in the brain. Uh, yeah, like you said, the brain, and, and then of course the brain, you know, has a skull and so you can mount things to it very easily. Yes. But uh, yeah, how, so how do you do it uh, going into the, the peripheral nerve? Uh, so um, it depends what, uh, so for, let's say, interfacing with the vagus nerve, which is in the neck, um, we, you know, there are chronic vas vagus nerve stimulators that can also record, you know, they're, they're just electrodes. Um, so there's, you know, different kind of surgical tricks um, that, um, like, like I mentioned, Savrozanos' group is working on that. Um, and they have something in uh, the pipeline for that. Um, so there, there are different ways to get it stable on the nerve so that you can record for months and stimulate for months. Uh, for the type of technologies that involve optical imaging, uh, like I mentioned with the calcium indicators, uh, we have to do the we have to do those with anesthesia, uh, just because of the movement artifact. So we haven't uh, got the technology to the point where we can image individual uh, neurons connected to the vagus nerve, let's say in peripheral ganglia, uh, while the mouse is moving around, just because there's just too much movement. Um, I think. You know, in the near future, um, you know, there might the tools might evolve a little more just because we're kind of uh, taking tools that were evolved to be mounted on the, the skull of an animal um, and kind of, you know, co-opting them to use in the periphery. Uh, we haven't found the solution to how we can do that while the animal is moving around. Um, but uh, I, I think I think it's a solvable problem. It's just been uh, difficult. And for the time being. Uh, our scientific question doesn't require us to answer that quite yet. 
Okay. Yeah. That was, that was my question is like, uh, do you have some kind of like necklace or something like this? And then, uh, because you also have to mount it, you know, you can, couldn't just have a, a cuff electrode or you could just have like everything built into a cuff electrode that, um, and it's all kind of built into yeah. one or something like yeah, this. I mean, it I sounds think, like, sounds like, uh, that's a lingering problem. I think that, I think what you mentioned, like having an, a, a, let's say a CMOS sensor built into a cuff electrode of some type, if the, you know, if the chip can be small enough and everything can be integrated so that it can live, you know, close to the nerve or connected onto the nerve. And, and that's just a matter of, uh, you know, miniaturization and, and size. So currently the, 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 the whole setup for that is, is still something that's very small, you know, it's, it's only several grams. Um, but it's not something that can be necklace sized, uh, for a mouse, uh, quite yet, but it, you know, you know, you know, with these things, the technology uh, moves rapidly. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be surprised if something like that was available in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, that'd be crazy. So you work on um, immune responses and how that's encoded into the neural signals. Um so how does that necessarily work? I mean, is that basically, uh, I mean, it's of course building off of Dr. Kevin Tracy's work and, and basically sensing what, um, antibodies are, uh, happen, you know, at, at the, at the, um, you know, distal end. And is that actually, is that also encoded? Cause I'm also in understanding that it's encoded into the neurons, like not just into the physiology, but like the, the protein structure or something like this. Is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, so basically, um, Dr. Tracy's work uh, from, you know, really two decades ago, to, you know, back in 2000 or so, um, showed the discovery of something called the inflammatory reflex, uh, which is that if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve, uh, I mean, this was basic science work originally discovered in, uh, in a rat. Um, if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve under conditions of inflammation, let's say acute endotoxemia, you inject a bacterial endotoxin, you cause inflammation, uh, that you can reduce levels of they're called circulating cytokines. Uh, so one's called a tumor necrosis factor, TNF. Uh, and, and these are uh, cytokines that are chronically elevated in different inflammatory disorders like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease. Uh, so that's, that's why there are patients currently uh, you know, this is a, there's some clinical trials and there's some companies pursuing this uh, that you probably know of as well, uh, putting vagus nerve simulators into the necks of patients uh, to, to basically trigger the inflammatory reflex, turn down these cytokines. So that's, that's what we call the, the motor efferent arc that descends from the brain because, you know, you're, you're stimulating the vagus nerve here. You're, you're changing the signals going down ultimately to the spleen. Uh, because that's where TNF is produced uh, for the most part. Um, so, you know, over 20 or so years of work in, in uh, Dr. Tracy's lab, they've mapped that efferent circuit, you know, descending down to the spleen uh, very well. Uh, we know that it's primarily cholinergic neurons. Uh, we just published a paper in PNAS last year showing the cholinergic neurons in the brain stem that originate the motor efferents that descend in the vagus nerve and then uh, go to a peripheral ganglion outside of the spleen, then they go to the spleen. So that controls the TNF. Uh, now the other side of it, which is the sensory afferent arc going up. So that's actually the majority of the fibers in the vagus nerve carry these sensory signals going up to the brain. Um, so that's the other side of the you know arc, right? A, a reflex arc is composed of an input and an output. Um, in this case, uh, that's where we're trying to find out um, how do inflammatory signals from the body, you know, uh, it could be the gut, it could be uh, signals from the lung. Um, how, how are those signals, when I say encoded, not so much in proteins, but encoded by uh, neural activity? Uh, so if we can record from those neurons... Uh, either with standard electrophysiology or, or some of these uh, techniques that I mentioned earlier. Um, well, how does the neural activity, uh, if we listen in on these neurons or watch these neurons, uh, reflect uh, some level of cytokine uh, that's hap being released? Uh, you know, let's say when uh, you get a cut on your abdomen, you know, there'll be inflammation there, there'll be TNF 
and IL-1, another interleukin-1, another cytokine released, how does the brain know that? Um, how does it know that at the level of neural signals is what we're interested in? Uh, did, did that, does that make sense or? Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> It, it is. It is, and that, that I guess aligns more with what I know about you know uh, about electronic medicine, and everything like this. And I was because yeah. when I read that, I was just like, wait, is it being encoded actually into the you know the structure itself? Okay, so basically, you're you're um, from the you know the thousands of cells in the strand. Uh, you're seeing which one um, is basically responding to which uh, factor and then kind of trying to tease out uh, tease out what's happening there and, and what it might be, something like that. Yeah, I mean, we know we know at some level that there are different, uh, you know, so uh, nociceptors that signal pain, for example, you know, there's different classes. There's an AV1.8, there's TRIP-V1, which is responsive to capsaicin. So that's what, uh, you know, when you sense uh, something hot, um, that, that activates TRIP-V1. Um, hot is in uh, pepper. Um, so... We know that there's different classes of nociceptors that are basically pain receptor uh, neurons uh, within the vagus nerve and other peripheral nerves. Um, so for a, an individual neuron to respond to something, some kind of antigen, it needs to have some receptors for it. You know, So we know there's TNF receptors, IL-1 receptors, just like there are you know, glutamate receptors or dopamine receptors, right? Um, so... You know, at, at the baseline, you know the cells need to have a, a receptor for some particular antigen to detect it, um, right? And and this is really what are, uh, this is what's interesting about the immune system is that there's all these barrier um, interfaces. You know, for our skin is one. Um, you know, there's different interfaces where there's these sensory neurons that are basically, you know, seeing what's in our external environment. Um, that's called exteroception. There's also another class of sens sensations happening called interoception, which is sensing within our body. You know, like uh, these these are maybe, you know maybe maybe below the level of conscious access because you know they're they're not things that we can attend to, um, but there are things that the the brain definitely knows, right? I mean, when uh, the you know the rate um, there's there's afferents from our lung, for example, sensory afferents that go up to our brain. Um, when you manipulate them and they've done these studies in mice, you can, you know, uh, change breathing rate or even, uh, hold, uh, a mouse in a state of, um, exhalation, um, from doing optogenetics by manipulating just the set of, uh, sensory afferent neurons from the lung that, you know, have a particular type of receptor, uh, you can control breathing in the same way. Uh, there's another set of, um, fibers that controls heart rate. Uh, there's a set of fibers we know that I spoke about briefly that go down to the spleen and control uh, cytokine production, right? So kind of like, you know, one big goal of bioelectronic medicine is to try to map all these different fiber subsets. What are the molecular details of them? Uh, what are the you know neural signatures of different signals going up to the brain? Uh, and then, you know, how do they look when they go down to the uh, end organ? Uh, because if we knew uh, those details... We can maybe put a device uh, like a you know a nerve interfacing device right before the nerve goes into that organ, and then control that organ, right? I mean that's uh, that's kind of uh, one of the goals is that if you had that understanding, so you need that neural circuit level understanding, and then if you had the technology to both read and write to that nerve um, in some kind of selective specific way, uh, right? And you don't want to current vagus nerve implants just wrap around the nerve. So, you know, they hit the whole bundle in some way with specific parameters. Um, but that's partially because we don't really understand all the signals going to all the nerves. Obviously, that's a that's a big problem to understand. Um, but that's definitely one of the things we want to try to understand um, so that we, you know, if bioelectronic medicine is to succeed, uh, we need to know what the nerve signals mean and then how to intervene to either manipulate them or block them in some way. Yeah, it does seem so. So what tools do you use? I mean, uh, it doesn't seem like, uh, the tools available tools available right now, uh, can do that. I mean, how do you, how do you tease apart, 
uh, all those different signals? Uh, I mean, the, the tools on the, so if we talk about uh, recording neural signals, um, the tools I think are, are, are pre- I mean, obviously they can always get better, um, but they're pretty good as far as being able to uh, discriminate. Uh, th- these are in animal models. Uh, it's obviously different when you go into a human, um, but the tools are pretty good to be able to read out because you can uh, do manipulations where you block specific subsets, either with chemical a- uh, antagonists, you know, to block, let's say, a trip V1 or trip A1 or others, you know, you can kind of de- delete parts of the molecular players in your signal and say, this is how the signal changes. Uh, you can also use optogenetics. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar uh, with that. Uh, so you can then, of course, yeah. um, express, you know, a light sensitive opsins, proteins uh, that you can c- control with light, you know, so you shine blue light on some subset uh, of the nerve or on an organ or in a part of the brain uh, and control only uh, some subset of neurons, let's say cholinergic neurons. Um, and so in that way, at least in a, in a mouse model, you can very precisely control uh, which group of um neurons, let's say cholinergic neurons, uh, get activated and are participating. You can also record those with a traditional nerve cuff, let's say. Um, So, I mean, from the perspective of, um, I guess, manipulating neural signals, I I think we have pretty good tools to do that. Uh, The the challenge is to then, you know, how do you bring, let's say, optogenetics into a human, which you, you know, there are companies doing it in the eye, because these are light sensitive options. So it makes sense to treat, you know, uh, I think it's used to treat macular degeneration or um, some type of blindness. Um, but, you know, and, and the viruses used to express uh, these neurons in specific populations are, are very safe now. Obviously in time, of, in time of coronavirus, people might not want a virus injected into their bodies, but, um, you know, like, let's say uh, in a few years from now, uh, these viruses are very safe. They're, they're, you know, replication incompetent, you know, adenoviruses. Um, This is, you know, some of the things we use to express in different animal models and they only go into a specific, um, it says, did we get lost? Can you still hear me? Yeah, no, I, I, I did. I continue to hear you, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It said uh, connection to server lost is for me okay. as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the the challenge, I think, I, I think we have pretty good tools to manipulate the, the circuits in animal models. Um, whether or not what we find out there can be translated to a person uh, is, is a different set of questions. But um, I think what we're really trying to do is find out all the... Um, different molecular players and the basic principles of these circuits. Uh, when we go into a person, there are different, uh, like, you know, different waveforms you can use, different types of electrical blocks you can use um, that are kind of more, you know, you know, uh, individuals like Warren Grill's lab and other labs have, have explored this space very thoroughly to uh, activate certain types of fibers. So, based on their, uh, the size of the axon. So, you know, like C fibers are the smallest, you know, A deltas are larger. So there are different uh, kind of electrical stimulation waveforms you can use um, to act to bu- kind of like bias your activation of a s- certain subset. But before you need to, before you know which ones to activate or block, uh, we want to know, you know, find out in a mouse model, let's say, uh, that those are the ones that you need to block or those are the ones you need to activate to treat this symptom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, uh, I think that's very, um, very true that like you can get around, uh, you know, not having the kind of, um, tools or electrodes or something like this, you can block it off at, at you know, the source and, and, you know, let only certain things go by and then, and then you, you know, uh, what's, which, which, uh, signals are causing what, um, yeah, very cool. So, uh, what do you think, uh, will be some future breakthroughs in this? I mean, if, uh, if you were able to find out, um, what signals did what, like, 
is the job over? Or, I mean, do you translate that immediately into humans and, and, uh, doesn't it change from individual to individual? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, so, um, I think one advantage is, uh, you know, obviously there's a, been a long standing interest in having personalized medicine. Um, and, and obviously, um, we know that in a lot of cases, uh, when people are, let's say undergoing neurosurgery, or even considering having a device of any type implanted, it, that's not their first line of treatment. You know, the, they're going to, um, for whatever the ailment is, you know, obviously it, they prefer to probably take a drug or a pill, uh, which uh, might be able to alleviate their symptoms. And if, if, if so, they're probably not going to want to go undergo a neurosurgical procedure to get something put on their vagus nerve. Uh, we, what we know is that um, some percentage, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of patients, let's say, uh, with uh, Crohn's disease, for example, do not respond to biologics. So these are um, um, anti-TNF monoclonal antibodies. So, you know, we know in that particular case that the cytokine that I mentioned, tumor necrosis factor, is elevated chronically, um, you know, and also in, in rheumatoid arthritis, that that elevation, you know, leads to persistent pain, uh, you know, joint problems, these kind of things. Um, some subset of patients, let's say 30%, don't respond to, to these drugs. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's not successful therapy for them. Um, and how does their biology differ from the other percentage that, you know, take the biologic and they're like, okay, great. Like, uh, I feel great. Right. Um, obviously there's some difference, uh, either, uh, probably in their biology and, and possibly in their disease as well. Um, and so I think one of the things that um, recording neural signals in different um, subjects or patients uh, gives you is, is you can see what that type of variation is across patients uh, and then be able to then design uh, treatments uh, based on that per person's biology. In that case, their neurobiology, right? I mean, um, so so that that is obviously also one of the goals. Um, but I think what's interesting is that uh, we know uh, in many diseases that drugs don't work for every patient for you know z disease X, um, and those patients might be better candidates for some other type of intervention. Um, it might be bioelectronic. It might be something else. But um, I, I think that's a very interesting uh, field to, to look into. And, you know, a lot for a long time, people thought it was a genome, you know, like you can use, um, you know, genome wide screening and, and see, you know, personalized this, this person did their 23 and me. So I can say, okay, you know, you should take this drug, but not this drug. Some cases in, in very, uh, you know, um, narrow cases that works, but for the most part that hasn't really panned out. Um, and, you know, just because just because we have the genome mapped, it doesn't mean we have all the answers uh, in the same way. I think once we even though we you know, mapped a worm connectome you know, at the EM level, uh, we won't necessarily have all the answers there. So um, I think there are there there is a lot of value to recording the neural signals if, when you can on a nerve and seeing, you know, uh, how does that relate to one, the pathology and then two, a potential treatment um, if you can manipulate those signals. Because what we know is that uh, these nerves that, you know, in our periphery and that descend ultimately from the brain connect to all our major organs and innervate uh, most of our tissues. So uh, there must be a reason for that, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, and we know, you know, from a lot of work that when you record close to, let's say, an injury site, uh, that there is uh, pathology from electro physiology standpoint, you know, there's either hyperactivity in the case of, of some pain symptom syndromes. Uh, and then when you, you know, you shunt that el electrical activity at the neuron level, uh, okay. you get resolution of some of the pain. So, uh, you know, it's not like these things aren't related to one another. And uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, it really is exciting. And, and, I, I guess, yeah, I hadn't really thought of that. Like, what is the evolutionary basis of this? Like, why why would this exist? Uh, yeah. Any theories about that? Why would the the nerve innervation exist? Or 
yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like why? I mean, yeah, I mean, and then part be, of it, being able to have the, con- uh, the body control antibodies or something. Uh, well, so for the the nerve innervation part of it is it's more you know just like with anything it's protection you know survival like you know we need to know uh, when there's like you know we're getting close to a fire um, so you know like you know don't don't put your hand near that fire um, that part of the signals you know uh, the way the the nervous system evolved you know they're sending signals very quickly to the brain so you don't put your hand near the fire um, but then also the immune response let's say we put our hand too close to the fire, it got burned. You know, there's a, a stereotyped immune response. Uh, and and really what we're interested in knowing is uh, when there's, uh, you know, heat there and there's inflammation, there's swelling, there's pain, uh, how do those signals, when they go to the brain, you know, uh, again, what is the, what's the neural basis of those signals? Um, not, not just for curiosity's sake, uh, but, you know, that could be important from the perspective of designing uh, interventions, you know, like, so obviously, um, pain on its own, as you probably know, is a huge field, um, you know, not only for pharmaceutical companies, and, uh, but, you know, from a standpoint of basic science, just understanding pain signals is huge, and obviously has a, you know, a direct translational impact to uh, patients suffering from different um, symptoms involving pain. Uh, So, you know, I think it's very important if we could understand the neurophysiology of the pain signals in these nociceptors um, and then, you know, come up with a way to intervene to either dampen or block those signals. Obviously, pain has an important evolutionary reason, right? I mean, they pr- pain protects us. But in some of these pathologies, you know, there's there's chronic pain, um, hypersensitivity, uh, these things, they're, they're not no longer protective, but they become, you know, uh, again, diseases and obviously result in a lot of suffering. Um, if we can uh, really understand what the pain signals mean, uh, of course, it's not just neurophysiology. There's molecular biology to it as well. Uh, different uh, damage associated um, uh, damps and pamps are released. Uh, again, they trigger neurons, but you can also intervene. And that's the basis of the, you know, the drug pharmaceutical com- um, business, right? Is that uh, if you come up with a compound that blocks this, uh, then you put it there uh, or, or you ingest it, but it goes ultimately there. Um, the, the problem with that is there are obviously a lot of side effects because you're, you know, taking a pill. Um, then, you know, there's other um, strategies like, you know, the TEN stimulators, electrical stimulators that you can put on different parts of your bodies to treat, let's say, back pain or something. And, and those essentially try to work in a more localized way. Um, to affect some of those receptors, uh, some of those nerve terminals that are ultimately go up to your brain because the, your pain is only sensed in the brain. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So well, yeah, it, yeah it, this it, is, uh, you know, fascinating stuff. I, I think this... No, I, I was going to say, I mean, I think there's a lot to there's a lot to figure out um, with with many of these uh, both at the basic science level uh, and then even if we understand like let's say some small circuit very well um, I think the technology once once we understand the circuit very well then I think we can design technologies or other engineers can design the technology to then answer and uh, you know address that specific. Uh, whether we need, we need a block of that's part of the circuit or whether we need to amp up this other part of the circuit, um, then the, the questions become a little more clear of what type of tools we need. Um, so, yeah, but, but it's exciting to, to be working on the, the, the basic questions for sure. Yeah, that is, that is really cool. That is really interesting. And, and you've mentioned so far many different types of circuits and, and, you know, uh, uh, sensing capabilities i mean how many are there is it like uh half a dozen or is it thousands or, or what if you had to guess what, what do you think it is uh i mean you know there's the traditional senses uh that are related to exteroception you know like sight sound smell touch uh taste um there's a a plethora of uh as i mentioned interoceptive signals as well 
that have to do with organ function. Um, I, w- I won't put a number on how many there are, but um, there, I would say there's, uh, and some some people have argued that uh, immune sensing, so a sensing of cytokines, uh, like some some of the things we're studying, could be you know a quote unquote sixth sense. Um, there's there's a couple papers about that out there, um, and yeah, I mean I think there's uh, there's a lot to be discovered within this space. Um, there there could be as many senses as there are really discrete receptors for each of these chemicals. Um, each of these stimuli, right? Because uh, within our body, there, there, you know, like there's transducers, something that takes, you know, touch, right? Like the reason why I can feel this is because there's mechanoreceptors uh, at these, you know, nerve terminals, and they're actually feeling me- mechanical movement. Uh, the, the reason why, you know, when I pinch too hard, then a nociceptor comes in and saying that, okay, that hurts. Um, these are all at some level chemical and electrical signals. Um, the ones we understand best, I think, uh, are, 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 you know, we're capable of accessing through our consciousness. That's why, you know, we can see something and describe it. So, you know, like, obviously, I think those are well understood. Um, you know, ask me again in 100 years, and probably we, knew, we know nothing now. Um, but I think uh, uh, on the converse, you know, the things we don't have ac- conscious access to, uh, our brain knows about at a subconscious level, um, you know, like what are, what our gut is doing. So there's obviously, uh, you know, a huge gut brain Vegas, uh, field on its own. Uh, the gut, uh, ha- is a second brain because there's so many neurons there. Um, and, and really what those neurons are doing when they t- talk to gut epithelial cells is a really hot area. Now, uh, again, it's not something that you know, we know, like we, we kind of know like what the gut's doing and that, okay, like I don't, my stomach doesn't feel good or something bad's going on. Um, but the actual basis of how we know that is, uh, you know, uh, an area of fruitful discovery, I think, um, because those are still neurons talking to some type of transducer in the gut in the same way that a neuron talks to uh, another uh, cell in our lungs that, you know, this is a physical thing that's happening or a chemical thing that's happening. It, it gets transformed into an electrical signal that goes up to our brain. Uh, you and I don't know about it because these things are happening a million times a second. Um, but they're important in a, many different diseases. Um, and that's kind of where we're, we're trying to kind of throw a little, uh, you know, microscope in, put some electrodes in and say, uh, you know, we think, the vagus nerve is an area that that carries a lot of these signals. It might it's not necessarily the only area, uh, only nerve, um, but we think a lot of these signals are happening there. That's a hot spot. Uh, let's listen in. Let's try to figure out um, what we can figure out there. I think. Yeah, that is the exciting thing for me for bioelectronic medicine is like kind of making conscious or, or like uh, quantifiable these, uh, these, you know, these different measurements that, that are already being measured by the body, but, yeah. you know, just not on a conscious level. So, uh, yeah. that's, that's my favorite, you know, um, idea about it. And then, then, you know, that tightens the feedback loop, you know, in case you do, do eat something or do something or take some kind of, uh, um, you know, psych, uh, uh, you know, farm, uh, pharmaceutical, then it can tell you like, okay, is this working or is how, how good or how bad is this doing? So, uh, that, that to me is the most exciting thing. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Chang, this has been really, uh, informative. I've really enjoyed this. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? Um, no, I mean, I think, um, I think we covered a lot of, a lot of bases. I lost track of where we were, but, um, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think if I, if I could quickly, pitch uh, the Feinstein Institutes as, uh, you know, as you know, you've spoken to several people here. Um, we, you know, we're trying to build a group of investigators that are interested in these type of questions and uh, kind of developing the next generation of technologies uh, to, you know, take this uh, beyond preclinical models. Uh, when we're able to translate some of these technologies into patients, which has already happened, um, how can we uh, improve on those, you know, patient-based therapies, um, connect that with, you know, we're connected to a big health system here, uh, Northwell Health, 
um, that, uh, you know, has access to a lot of clinical trials and a lot of patients. So um, I think uh, it's an exciting place to be. In, and and um, I think you'll you'll hear more from some of the people here. Um, and, and thank, thank you, um, Vladimir, for, for connecting with us and with me. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.